Hi, I'm Lisa Waitman. I'm a three-time Olympian and just recently ran 225 for the marathon. Uh, you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the is failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been having a great week and you've been kicking some goals out there pursuing your physical best. If you are yet to listen to any of the episodes, perhaps this is your first time joining us on the Physical Performance Show, a mighty hello. If it's your 60th time joining us on the Physical Performance Show, a mighty hello all also, and also thanks for returning. And if you've missed any of the previous guests, be sure to jump back across and check out the archives of the Physical Performance Show podcast. There's been some great sharings in recent times from Pat Carroll last week, sharing around his international marathon and running career. Dean Canazis, the ultra marathon man before Pat, and then also Matt Poole, Kellogg's Nutrigrain Ironman Series champ, sharing around how he persisted for 10 years to get that breakthrough series victory. So some great stuff. If you've missed the previous episodes, I'm sure you'll take a lot out of those athletes sharing and take some great inspiration from them also. So guys, we have a bumper episode today and a little bit more on today's guest in just a moment, but a heads up. We're carrying on the marathon theme that we set up with Dean Canazis through to Pat Carroll and now to today's guest, which would be Lisa Jane Waitman. More on Lisa in a moment. Today's show, though, is lovingly brought to you, as always, by Pogo Physio. We are Australia's first fixed-fee, unlimited physiotherapy program practice. And we do this for one simple reason, that is to ensure that any patient that steps through the doors of Pogo crosses their physio finish line. What's a finish line? It's simple. It's finishing rehabilitation. It's getting back to your physical best from injury or pain. And we love getting patients across their physio finish line. It restores their energy. It restores their vitality, creates happier people, and generally they are at their best when they're at their physical best. And we do this through our unique two, six, and 12-week finish line programs. It features unlimited hands-on treatment, access to services such as remedial massage and podiatry, and access to state-of-the-art equipment including Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill running and oodles of clinical Pilates classes. So if you're serious about rehabilitation and getting back to your physical best, be sure to jump over and check out pogophysio.com.au And from July 2017, we are bringing the finish line programs to a practice near you. So we are taking that beyond the Gold Coast where this show is recorded into the states of Australia. So be sure to keep up to date with the POGO Partners program also. A massive thank you to you, the listener, who makes this show work each week by listening. Without you, I'd be pretty lonely. But a big thanks in particular to... You, the faithful listener who has taken time to leave a review on iTunes, and a massive thank you this week to Beegs, who commented, whoa, five stars, and Beegs goes on to write, have not listened to them all yet, but Brad, keep doing what you're doing, it is sensational. Rob DeCostella, Matt Rogers, Kane Eckstein are just a couple where I've thought, wow, the Sam Weir was a standout. 
Funny and what a weapon. Really keen to hear from a few more ultra runners. Well, Beegs, hopefully that was delivered upon with the ultra marathon man, Dean Kanazis, a few episodes ago on episode 58. So Beegs, if you missed that one, be sure to jump over, listen to Dean's share-ins. But a massive thank you for taking the time to leave the review. And listeners, if you'd like to leave a review, it helps the show enormously get into more earbuds and more visible on iTunes. And it's as simple as jumping over to iTunes, clicking ratings and review, one star if you think it's okay, five stars if you love the program, and that'd be fantastic. Listeners, today's guest is a continuation of our marathon theme. We started with Dean Kanazis, we went to Pat Carroll, and now we're over here with Lisa Waitman, who is setting the women's running scene in Australia on fire in the Cross the Marathon distance. Many of you will know that recently Lisa had a great performance in the 2017 Virgin London Marathon, where Lisa finished in incredible fifth position, running a 2.25.15. And this was off the back of what Lisa shares in today's episode was a disappointing Olympic campaign in the Rio Olympic Games 2016, where Lisa was unwell, but she battled on to finish that event and was taken away for medical assistance after. Lisa's also been an Olympic Games representative for Australia at the 2012 London and 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. In addition to three Olympic outings, quite a bio, isn't it? Lisa's also been the bronze medalist in the marathon at the 2010 Delhi Commonwealth Games, and also an IAAF World Cross Country Championship bronze medalist in 2008, where she competed with the Australian women in Edinburgh to pick up a medal that year. Lisa has a very rich history of competition right from the junior years of which she shares around today. And one of the things that I believe makes Lisa so endearing to the Australian and wider running community is how Lisa manages to hold a career down and also juggle a young family and still perform at her physical best. So there's so much to take from Lisa's sharings on today's episode of the Physical Performance Show. Let's jump straight in with Lisa Waitman. So listeners, I am sitting here in a hotel room actually in Canberra uh, after just uh, presenting at the ESSA Exercise Physiology Conference uh, here in Canberra and joining me for a very special interview is Australia's uh, marathon female champion of the moment and that's Lisa Waitman. Lisa, it's absolutely great to have you and we'll talk about it as we go but it's a historic day to be speaking to you with uh, all things happening in the world of marathon. I know, it's an amazing day. I'm sure everyone that's interested in distance running was glued to the TV or glued to their uh, their iPad today um, watching a phenomenal uh, effort out on, on a racetrack. Well, I, I don't think we can not go there first, Lisa, so I'm going to hold back the normal question we kick off the interviews with and let's dive straight into today i mean the break in two marathon project by nike um years in the making <clears throat> unlimited amount of resource untold amount of resources i should say um and i know lisa uh your affiliations with a different shoe company so i'm not trying to create any uh, too much concern here but just from a marathon perspective a physical performance perspective um what do you what was your take on how it played out today i think it's wonderful to see um you know such a high caliber of athletes dedicating themselves to trying to find the absolute best they can out of themselves and, and being supported to be able to do that. So it's a pretty good showcase for distance running. And and I guess it also was a little exciting to see others try and run at the pace and, and a little joking around there as to, you know, the commentator trying to have a crack at that pace and only lasting <laughs> a few metres. So it's always funny when you are when you get to see people do that at the same time as the marathon's going on. And always with a marathon, there's plenty of factors that um, that – come into play and that I guess they highlighted that you know they picked the exact right weather uh, they had paces going in and out and finding paces in the world to be able to run and stay with an athlete for the entire entire race at that world record pace is pretty difficult because anyone that can do that would be trying themselves so there's lots of factors that that go into it everyone needs to be healthy exactly the right time and 
and uh, eating the right things. I was interested to know how long they carbo loaded for, given they weren't sure exactly which day out of a few picks they had. So quite interesting to see how the physiology, um, how they they attempted the physiology there too. But great that we can see that that two hour barrier is um, is certainly within reach and. Um, yeah, exciting for the future. And it's significant too. I believe it was 1948 or it might have been 54, but on this day that the four-minute mile was broken. So I, I know they had a window of time to get there, but I wonder how how much it was dictated that they wanted to have it you know, on the same day. But did you, in your last question on the Breaking 2 project, Lisa, but did you in your heart feel it was possible? I, for one, uh, put out, I think I had around a 201 and and then just out of optimism I said oh let's make it a 159.58 um, but in your heart of hearts did you think it was doable today? Oh look I think if you have absolutely everything going your way absolutely perfectly which I think they did then it was certainly it was certainly doable but I think the I guess the one thing to take home is that we're all humans and we do have limits, so um, we can keep trying to break them um, and find new ways to break them, but it's quite exciting to see that even even the best of the best have limits and have to find better ways to, to become the best they can. A lot of the Africans, when they finish a marathon, and some of the other, other competitors seem to have a little bit of energy left when they finish a marathon, and I don't t- tend to be able to do all that much um, so after my run, my legs are usually killing me. So it was quite nice to see to see that his legs are a little bit sore at the end. And and you have been known to give so much that you do get taken away with some medical assistance. So yeah, I uh, I don't quite uh, understand how there can be a reserve either, Lisa, after a flat out marathon. But Lisa, a, a fun question: uh, What's one thing that scares Lisa Jane Waitman? Um, I guess uh, I guess the future of not being able to um, demonstrate the best version of me just in general life like I'm I'm got lots of facets to my life and I I try and achieve my best in all of those and and it will be nice um you know when I'm a lot older and and finished all of my careers to know that I've given everything I can in all of those aspects and and you'd hate to for any of that to be cut short so I guess that's kind of kind of what scares you that you just don't know what how much time you might have and how did you get started Lisa what's the origin stories I know you were a track runner in your early days and cross country and then obviously found your way over to the marathon but take us right back to you know growing up what did that look like for you Uh, when did you first realize you had some talent uh well I used to have um go for a few little runs with my dad and my sister when I was quite young and there were very short, um, short little runs that my sister and dad would do. And one day I actually went out with dad and Jody on a run up at my grandparents' place up at Nagambi. And um, we set out and we got about a mile out in the back roads in Nagambi. And I decided that I was too hot and too tired to finish and made dad carry me all the way back home. Um, so that was my, my first uh, initiation into trying to do a long <laughs> run, youngster, and it's quite uh, quite amusing given that I then became a marathon runner, uh, that, that I got my dad to carry me all the way home and gave up. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's sort of where I started, just, you know, dad encouraged me to, to run cross country at school, and, and at first I thought it was a bit crazy because you just had to go out in the cold uh, cold days of um, Melbourne winter at Bundura Park and, and slop, slosh it out in the mud. So didn't enjoy it that much. But when I started winning as a junior, then I started to think, oh, maybe I actually can can run. And, and Dad would take me on longer runs than, than that mile race and um, all that mile run we did. And, and I'd keep up. And he said to me later that he used to pick up the pace a little bit and I'd always respond. So um, yeah, so we enjoyed our time, Dad and I, doing those little runs together. And I did a lot of training actually um, as I grew as I grew a bit older around the Preston Football Club, which was my, where my dad played and coached, and he played uh, for Fitzroy and back in the day. So I spent a fair bit of time growing up around the footy clubs and uh, and just for safety reasons, did a fair bit of training around the Oval. So. I sort of, I guess, ended up being a bit more of a cross-country runner as a junior and tended to get a little injured every time I tried to do a little bit of serious track running. And, and so it was really hard for me to to progress and demonstrate my ability on the track because um, the body just wasn't too keen on the, the intense work. So it wasn't until I then moved into a bit more road running and, and jumped off the track and didn't put spikes on that I kind of 
really sort of excelled and and started to find that I had a bit more talent in those longer road races. And was there any one particular event, Lisa, or uh, moment that you can recall where through those formative years, you know, running alongside your father, um, et cetera, and then onto the track and cross-country courses that you went, I've actually got a real measure of ability here. Was there any one moment where it really sort of started to solidify that you, you've got some talent? Uh, my dad always said to me that he thought that I did have a lot of talent. He he was never one to push me. He just wanted Jodie and I, my sister and I, to uh, you know to find our passions. And they, mum and dad, always supported us to believe in ourselves and and to give everything a go. And so um, we had a really good environment to try new things and try different sports and uh I guess I just I I guess I struggled a little bit with confidence when I was little I was quite a shy little girl and um and I I I don't really think that I ever would have believed that I would make three Olympics win a Commonwealth bronze and and now run 225 back when I was young you know when I was young I thought it was a would be a dream to become an Olympian but never really believed that I'd be one so I guess I didn't really believe in myself until each time I actually achieved something that I thought was, you know, um, pretty amazing. So um, each thing built on the next thing and each achievement built on the next. And, and even to this day, I guess my career has been very similar. Um, you know, I've had to pull my support team to believe in me and, and, and help me believe that I could do certain things because, you know, not everyone's there thinking that you can do certain things and, and you want to get confidence from one race or from one training session to another to build on to the next. And were there outside your father, Peter, who you mentioned as a, you know, a, a footballer, were there any significant uh, coaches or people who came alongside you in those early years that sort of really encouraged you? And I know you met, just referred that to pulling people along in, you know, this current stage of your career, but, you know, in the, in the formative years, was there a coach or anyone that really played a significant role, Lisa? Yeah, look, I've had three coaches. So um, I started off my career... Uh, funnily enough, I, after I realised I could do a bit of running, um, mum and dad rang up the local Preston Athletics Club coach, Jeff Hawkins, and uh, he coached all the little athletes and, and the seniors and um, to see whether there'd be an opportunity for me to join the club. And they didn't have any girls in the club at the time, and so I actually joined the under-14s, or under-15s maybe it was, uh, boys' team and ran the fourth leg of the boys' relay so it was quite an interesting initiation into um, into athletics to to go in there and start entering the the male division of the relay, um, and it was a bit daunting, but it was quite a yeah quite an, a great opportunity really because I built a wonderful relationship with um, with Jeff and his family and and the Preston Athletics Club, and I'm a life member of the club now, and um, and then he carried me through those those junior years until I then went on to um, to make a relationship with Dick Telford and with Pam Turney and um, through history of Dick Telford having coached my dad at Preston, Dick was a Liston Trophy winner and an amazing sportsman as he is still to this day and um, and he was always my advisor and, and set me up with a relationship with the, the late Pam Turney and I had many years with Pam um, running world cross country, uh, running world half, um, enjoying lots of wonderful training sessions with Pam and with my gir- with the girls who have become great friends of mine and um, and then when we moved into the marathon uh, then uh, Dick stepped back in to advise me uh, and help me and coach me through those those marathon years so it's I've been really lucky I've had fantastic people looking after me every step of the way and and everyone has been really supportive in that journey and um, and I couldn't be, uh, you know, couldn't be more grateful for that. Yeah, and certainly Dick Telford. I mean, uh, obviously coached Michael Shelley to the Com, Com Games uh, gold medal there, and uh, this is a whole stable of talent, uh, of including yourself, Lisa, from the, the Telford stable. So um, certainly uh, the runs are on the board. In the lead-up to... Um, you know some of the breakout standout performances. I mean, chronologically, some of the main uh, what I have in front of me under twenty three main highlights under twenty three cross country champion uh, in two thousand and three. Uh, you then went on to become a double uh, national champion in the ten thousand uh, meters and the half marathon in two thousand and six. So several years later, 
On to the road running champs in 2006, where you placed 37th overall. Was that uh, what race did you? Does that what race distance did you run there at the road running champs in 2006, Lisa? Where you finished 37th? Yeah, we had a trip to Hungary um, for the world. Uh, it was called World Road Racing, and it was a 20k road race. Okay. Uh, my two half marathons are quite disappointing. Um, I actually got sick in, on both trips. We had to travel to quite obscure parts of Hungary and then later the next time was um, Udine in Italy um, and both times I actually got sick. So uh, it was, yeah, stomach bugs in both occasions. So um, those two experiences, well, it was wonderful to, to make the Australian team. They were actually quite challenging finishing those two half marathons and so thankfully I then went on to represent Australia in in World Cross and and in the marathon to uh, make sure that I made my experiences a lot more pleasant. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The highs and the lows, it's what it's all about, right, hey? And uh, one of the highs, 2008, over to the uh, IAAF World Cross Country Championships where along with Benita Johnson then, uh, you know, Nee Willis uh, picked up the bronze medal with the Aussie girls. That would have been, at that point, I imagine, quite a career highlight, Lisa. Absolutely. I went into that race super excited. The girls were a fantastic team, and, and I ran so strong that year. I was really fit. I'd ran a really quick time around the TAM um, back in Melbourne, which we all sort of measure ourselves on. And um, and I just start, I think that's sort of the time where, where I really just sort of changed as an athlete and I really stopped getting injured so regularly. I was able to put together some real consistent training. And, um, and also um, another aspect was that I was training with my husband a lot more, who was my boyfriend at the time. And, and that was helping me too, because I was finding out more and more what I could deliver on the track. And, um, and he really helped support me through that. And he suggested that I should give the London Marathon a go a couple of weeks later. So I had this really exciting trip where I'd go to World Cross, then run a, run the uh, Great Run in Dublin, uh, the 10K the week after, and then run the London Marathon. And, and so I guess I just kind of had this really positive outlook for that trip. And, um, yeah, and when you're positive and excited and you've done some great preparation in the lead-up, then, you know, you, you can tend to produce your best on the day provided you don't pick up any bugs <laughs> on the way. <laughs> and then what a day it was. And then from, you know, world cross country uh, success, you know, you made your marathon debut not long after. And from my understanding, your debut marathon, 232.32, netted you a spot in the an Australian team for the marathon for the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. Have I missed any of the details there, Lisa? Uh, yeah, that was um, a pretty cool experience. I didn't know what to expect for the marathon. I was not even running an average of 100k a week when I ran London. So, I had no idea what to expect. I was focusing totally on the cross country race, and the um, the marathon was the sort of the other thing I was I was going to have a go at, and and to come through and run a two thirty two. I think I ran two thirty two twenty three. I think it was um, to miss by just that very small margin, and uh, with the there was about it. There was a sleet, sleety rain headwind um, at about five miles to go, and I remember thinking to myself, "Gee, I'm." I'm not going to hit the wall, but I really would like to stop now. It's a really long way, and and I'm feeling like I've got really tired legs. So <laughs> I had to push on through that, and and um, yeah, got so close to that time. But it was um, really fortunate that I was given the opportunity to go to Beijing and and start my career as a marathon runner because you just never know, I guess, when when you're at a crossroad, what um, some decisions might. Um, might path that they might take you on and i mean at that point uh i mean what a great way to debut at olympic games birth i think that's just a beautiful uh was there a crossroads that you were at lisa was there a legitimate other direction you might have gone in other than the marathon oh no really it's just you know you just want to you know there's very various stories of many athletes from many countries that that may just miss out on a qualifying time and and that changes the nature of their path and um but for me i was really lucky to have the opportunity to go to uh to beijing off that time and that really um you know sort of set me on my path and and i mum and dad always thought that i'd have that i had the engine to to be a long distance runner um, and so it was nice to actually see that I could do it because I'm someone who 
only really believes I can do something when I actually do it. So, um, so we, so it was nice to, to get that started and know that I really had a future there. Um, you know, I've got a full-time career with Mm. IBM and, and which is now part-time at the moment with a baby, but, uh, I've been working my whole career and, and now as a mum, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things to juggle and, um, you know, and we all need to, to survive in life and, and eat and, and, and have a home and pay a home loan and all those things that we all need to do in life. And so to have the opportunity to be able to do all of those things, um, you know, it, it, it is a blessing, I guess. And, and I mean, that's one of the things I know, Lisa, from the, uh, particularly the female runners who, you know, when I posted up that I was catching up with you to record this, you know, there was quite a bit of support there that, you know, uh, please ask Lisa how she juggles it and we'll get to that. But I think it's important for the listeners to know that you've achieved everything in your career, as you say, whilst holding down up until I suppose there recently as you said a, a full-time from my understanding fairly demanding role you know with a big corporate IBM and and now in the last two years obviously being a, a mum to your beautiful little boy Peter so so on that first marathon just before we go off that Lisa a lot of listeners uh to the program are runners and many of them on any at any, any given time are lining up a debut marathon can you remember uh one what was going through your head at the start of that debut marathon were you nervous and two what the last few k's were like was it as you expected yeah look i had been told um, by a few people that and one in particular that the marathon at about 30 to 35k you get this unbelievable feeling like you just cannot go on and so i was running along at about 25 thinking okay i haven't got long until this feeling comes and (laughs) you know like being a bit quite scared about what was going to happen and how this this all would hit me and and that none of that happened I fueled pretty well I think and I paced myself pretty well because I didn't hit the wall I just got really tired legs and and thought to myself and the thoughts were more along the lines of wow this is a really long way (laughs) running a marathon (laughs) which is stating the obvious no doubt Um, so yeah but but I guess I think um yeah I was sort of running along okay and I'd slowed down a little bit I think I went out in about 75 minutes through halfway so I slowed down a little bit in the second half um but I didn't have the marathon legs I hadn't been training on roads I hadn't been um doing any form of real long marathon training so i certainly had never ran a 30k long run i think i actually ran from memory i ran halfway around melbourne running a one uh, three hour run just to make sure that i could make the distance um, i don't know how far i covered but i just wanted to know that i could run for three hours and i did it once and that was all in the lead up to um into up to the marathon so i knew following that marathon that i needed to uh to work out, work on a training program that was then going to um, progress me to, to faster times and and uh, stronger rate, stronger runs. Yeah, wow. Well, well, let's keep this theme of uh, your performances going. We'll cover some performances, including, you know, the highs, the recent success in London. You know, one of the dis- you know for you, I know, it was a, a run that didn't go to plan, Rio, and and then also London. So we want to cover those, and then I really want to dig in around Lisa around just you know how you juggle it. I think it'll be really quite insightful and inspiring for many listeners. So let's just cover the events just first. I got to ask. Obviously, you went on to London 2012 Olympic Games. You picked up a bronze medal 2010 um, in New Delhi in the marathon. Um, and then uh, over on to Rio 2016 last year. And uh, and I, 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 what happened there in Rio? I mean, uh, obviously, uh, anyone that follows your career with some interest would know that you were, you know, you were disappointed. Can you give listeners an insight into your preparation for Rio and then what happened on the day? Yeah, Rio was the most disappointing thing that's, that's really ever happened, I guess, in, in my career and probably my life to be a bit dramatic. But... Um, I was in the fittest, uh, shape I'd ever been in. I trained amazingly well. Um, the, the sessions I was doing were, were out of sight, you know, better than I'd ever done before. And the volume was better. Everything pretty much was better than before. There were a few little hiccups with, um, with a bit of cold weather in winter. So we needed to get into a heat chamber and and do some running in the warmer climate which was um basically just the storeroom in my my house with uh with very old house with um some heat with a heater on 
uh, surrounded by storage boxes. So it wasn't anything too glamorous. It was it was pretty pretty laid back environment, but it was hot enough to to create a sweat. So I I did that, and then we went up to Noosa for a few weeks, where the weather didn't quite hit the temperatures we were hoping at the time, but we put in some amazing sessions, Locke and I, and uh, and then we came back and uh, and had a week or week and a half at home to to get organised, and then I. I went off to the training camp and, and look, Dick and I didn't want to go to the training camp. Um, we didn't think Florida was the right place to go for a marathon runner uh, in the lead up to Rio and we wanted to extend our time in Queensland and then head and then just have one one flight situ- flying situation across to Rio. But um, logistics and, and other things came into play and we weren't permitted to do that. So we headed over to Florida, and when I landed in Florida, I, I had pretty severe headaches, and um, and I went out for my first 30-minute run with Michael Shelley, and and by the end of it, I was dizzy, um, my heart rate was really high, and and I was sort of wondering what was going on, um, but we put that down to a bit of jet lag and and the really humid, um, yucky climate of Florida at that time, and and um, and sort of pressed on a bit, and. Um, and it wasn't, I guess, because I was doing sort of lower lower grade sessions and lower grade running at that time in the in that taper period. It wasn't as obvious as it would have been if I had tried to do a normal week at home. But um, turns out I ended up um, contracting a virus and um, 20k into the marathon. I was seeing stars. I was super dizzy, and um, and yeah, I just don't even really know how I actually finished. So I was pretty amazed to finish in the position that I finished, and and proud to get to the finish line um, in one piece. But it was pretty scary after the race, and and our doc Adam Castricum really looked after me and took me to medical and and made me feel a bit more secure. But I was quite worried about what was happening to me at the time and and how the body was reacting and. And I have to say that if that had been my first marathon, I would have been pretty frightened to try and do it again. So um, I'm really fortunate that it wasn't my first marathon, and I knew what it was like to uh, to be in the right, you know, in the right um, phys- physiological state, and 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 have another one, and have another go, and, go and and run my London time that I did a few weeks ago. Well, let's go. Well, let's go to London. Much more exciting and a better memory for you. But that bridge between Rio and I remember watching the race, Lisa, and uh, I think it was made clear early in the commentary that you know that you may have had something happening, and it was clear from anyone watching that you know knows how you run that uh, you weren't your normal self. So uh, kudos to you for uh, pushing onto that finish line when everything in your body was screaming to not uh, not get there. So I mean that's that's real character. So you you came back from the disappointment for yourself of Rio um, that, you know, in terms of your expectations you would have normally had uh, bar from getting sick and you hit, hit Australia uh, and were you determined at that point to find the next marathon or was there a period where you felt a little bit flat and lost or were you straight on to the next event and planning for it? Um, we got back and I, I took a little bit of time. I was feeling quite unwell and then I, I pulled up with a bit, quite a sore ankle and had that um, that checked out and scanned and I had a little bit of a stress reaction in there as well. So it took, um, you know, it was, well, that was probably about two weeks after I got home. Then So I then had to have five weeks off after that. Um, so it wasn't then and until I sort of progressed through that five weeks that we started to look into marathon options. I know Dick and I spoke pretty quickly after the event and, and, said, and he said, let's get another marathon on the – on the cards really quickly because we need to demonstrate the fitness that you're in because I've never seen you in such amazing shape and you know we we're obviously quite disappointed especially with Michael getting his Achilles injury as well it it was a big blow given given where we'd been training and how we'd been going uh, so we originally were thinking a, a pretty early marathon but then my foot and my ankle got sore and and so that sort of um, you know, put a stop to any of those plans. So, um, the we real I really wanted to go back to London. I'd had a great experience that first time and ran well in the Olympics and there in the Olympics and um and I had missed out on an opportunity to run there and I think it was about two thousand eleven because I didn't um recover from Delhi all that quickly. So uh it was nice that we had the opportunity to go back to London and I got once I got into that elite field I was pretty excited and we were pretty motivated to um to get 
going again and get ready for that event. So, yeah, look, it, it was really scary, the Rio experience, and, and I was really glad to get home and to get, you know, get checked out and all of that. And once once I knew that it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't my body doing strange things, it was a virus, I was quite content to keep going and get, get back into it again. So, um, yeah, we got back into training. We touched on the fitness that we um, that I built on in Rio, and Dick doesn't think I necessarily got as fit for London as I did for Rio, but um, we certainly got pretty close to it, and and so it was really nice to have absolutely wonderful conditions on the day and the perfect build up and a great support team and and a and a happy healthy toddler along the way and and on the flights and during the time we were there, so everything really just fell into place. I feel like I ate the right things throughout. I feel like I fueled correctly. Um, I took my drinks in on all of that really well, better than ever before. I think everything just kind of fell into place and, and the first half of the race felt really comfortable. And, and then, you know, the second half of the race is always where you start to work hard. And, and apart from, you know, your, your patch of a kilometre here or there where you realise how far it is, um, it was a pretty good experience. <laughs> and, and, I mean, you know, you, you've been very modest there, but, I mean, finishing fifth, uh, 2.25.15, uh, a marathon PB of, uh, I believe, two minutes plus. Is that right? Yeah, well, I ran 2.26.05 in Melbourne. and um, oh, That's right. And, yeah, and I worked – hard from the start in that event and and um and I was so excited about about running that quick and finishing on the G and all my family being there it was a pretty cool experience um but we always knew uh, we were targeting 225 back then and and we always knew well my coach all my three coaches had predicted that I could run 225 um at some stage in my career and so everyone really um, was celebrating afterwards because I finally cracked that number and and um, yeah and Dick's pretty pretty excited that um, he still got more he thinks that he can get out of me so um, yeah so we'll only see what happens now in the future we just need some some perfect days like London. Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, there's uh, there's quite a few questions that people have uh, popped up actually about one of the photos I posted of you running in London. You mentioned you, you got things right. Uh, someone's asked what the yellow, was it a sauce bottle you were running with? <laughs> <laughs> My mustard bottle. Yeah, I've always used those. They're really easy to hold on to. Um, yeah, you, you just pick them up at the $2 discount stores around Melbourne. Uh, and, yeah, the, my nephew, my Thomas, who's um, who's a dear a boy and we've, um, you know, we've watched him grow up and, and hopefully I've motivated him and, and helped him by being a role model for him throughout his, you know, his time trying to be a sportsman himself. And he and little Pete uh, put stickers of trucks and garbage trucks and Australian flags on them for me before we left. And so I think... They were a little bit extra special, those sauce bottles, um, than ever before. And I'm looking at one, and I can see that little Aussie flag down there. So that that does give has to give you a lift, right? Uh, beautiful. And Lisa, just to, to give listeners some perspective, what were you, what was your sort of average mileage going into to your London performance in the in the weeks leading into it? Yeah, I was running 160k a week. Um, you know, I don't tend to have enough time to do all that much more. I know the Elite runners will be running, you know, 200 plus k's a week, and and I just can't do that with, with work and a, and a toddler. But um, look, I I get the best out of myself that I can with with what I've got and and the, the life I've got. So I don't have the opportunity opportunity to be a full time athlete. I can't support myself or my family um, as an athlete. So uh, this is the way we have to do it, and and we do our very best to achieve what we can with what we've got. And let's go there now. I mean, you juggle, you know, uh, your career, um, you juggle being a mum and obviously the running load. And how, I mean, people wonder, how do you do it? I mean, obviously Lachlan, your husband, uh, is incredibly supportive and you've got a great support team around you. But practically, how do you do it? Is it as easy as it might appear from the outside looking in or is it a daily a daily challenge? Uh- I wouldn't say it's a daily challenge because, you know, we love running, so we really enjoy running and it's a great opportunity for that Locke and I have that we get to do it together and that he really loves it. He was a track runner himself, uh, a 1,500-metre runner and steeplechaser and um, I'm fortunate that, that he's really keen to help me and, and do the longer stuff now. 
Uh, and look, that's part of it is really enjoyable, and it's certainly quite easy training for a marathon, like the timing for London, because we have daylight saving and it's it's beautiful nights to run in Melbourne and do all our sessions. But it's certainly a lot harder and a lot more challenging in the darker winter nights. Um, so we will be running out at you know we won't get home from work till about six o'clock on our work nights or my work nights, and um, and then we're out the door for a session and we might not be back until about quarter to nine. So um, yeah. it's, it you know, those nights in the in the winter months are quite challenging and, and, and add a bit of rain there and, and you certainly want to hide under the doona, but like any normal person. But when you've got a goal in mind, then the good thing is that we've got each other to push each other out the door. Yeah. But really without the support team that we have, without um, Pete's amazing grandparents and, and my sister, um, and the way that we structure our, our days and our weeks between us all so that we can, my sister can and focus on her career and, and we can run and, and do our work and make sure both um, both the boys, my nephew Thomas and, and Peter, well looked after and taken care of. We have a bit of a logical puzzle of a calendar that we tweak each day and, and make sure that we're all achieving what we need to achieve. And we also had dad um, with his football for a long period of time too. So there was quite a lot, there's quite a lot of balls in the air um, for us all. But um, the exciting thing is when one of us is, is achieving something, it, you know, it's thing to celebrate as a team really, uh, because without each other, none of this would be possible. And was your sister there in London recently? I believe I might've seen a photo with your nephew, I think in the photo. So was she, was she there? No, she wasn't. No, she didn't come to London, but um, my nephew would have loved to come to London, but no, he wasn't there either. There was, um, I'm not sure which photo that was. Probably but, an old one. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah, he's actually told me that he wants to be at the next trip, so I'll have to have a conversation with Jay. I think that's right. Where he wants to go. <laughs> he's booked himself in. Lisa, let's do a performance round. This is a, a little bit like an interval session, and I want to get through this and then throw to some questions from the listeners, which there's some really good questions that have come up for you. So this performance round, uh, here we go. It's uh, fast, rapid answers to the questions, right? Here we go. Training session you most dislike? It would have to be hills. Hills, training session you most love? Four by a mile on the track. Four by one. Favourite pre-race meal, Lisa? Uh, I tend to be pretty boring and eat rice and veggies. <laughs> rice and veggies. F- uh, Favourite bedtime. Bedtime. Bedtime is unfortunately not before 10.30. <laughs> yeah. Morning time. Morning rise time. Uh, whatever time Pete wakes up, it could be anything between 4 a.m. and uh, – Seven, I guess. So just quickly pause in there. Does that mean that morning runs, are, you know, they're a challenge at times depending on Pete's body clock? Yeah, we do a lot of singles. Um, but, yeah, morning runs tend to be very um, hit and miss. Wow. Wow. Who's the athlete, Lisa Waitman, that you most admire and why? Uh, I guess my hero would be um, Lisa Ondiki. Um, and the reason being is that I guess I see myself as such a hard worker and I know that she was such a hard worker and I've always, um, you know, aspired to be um, as good as her on, on the marathon stage. Beautiful. Toughest competitor you've ever raced and why? Um, probably myself, I reckon, <laughs> because I don't really think too hard about about the others. It's more about what I can achieve and, and, um, and how much better I can get and how much more I can get out of myself. Yeah, nice. Best recovery tip? Uh, just having a moment to yourself to sit down. As a parent, you you would know this. Uh, you don't get much time on your own. So any time that I get to sit down and have a break is recovery. <laughs> yeah, so it's so true. Says me sitting here in Canberra while my wife's up there in, on the Gold Coast trying to put our little <laughs> girls to bed. So big shout out to you, honey. Uh, your worst injury, Lisa? Uh, I broke my sacrum. Um, it was the most excruciating pain that I had um, for quite a few weeks uh, while it started to, to get to heal. Uh, that was probably the worst one that I've ever had. Yeah, was that a stress fracture? Yeah. Oof. One word to describe your racing style? Determined. How would you describe being in the zone? Calm. When was the last time you were in the zone? I know the answer to this question. <laughs> London. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, great. And uh, what's the silliest thing you've ever done 
in managing an injury? Uh, I think I had a string of about six shin splint injuries, which turned to stress fractures. And instead of stopping when I got the early signs, I just kept running through them. Uh, Just, you know, the age old distance runner challenge. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear. I live two lives. One is a runner that, you know, does does the things runners do and one is a physio that sometimes does what we tell patients to do. Um, Lisa, what's the funniest thing you've ever seen while out running, training or racing? Uh, I think that the funniest thing would probably not necessarily be hilariously funny but more so funny as in a race tactic. But I've, I've been clotheslined on a start line at a cross-country race once. Clothesline? Please explain. Oh, uh, so like someone who's put their arm out in oh. front of you, a gun goes off so that you uh, either can't go through or you uh, like basically run into an arm. <laughs> and, uh, and you, so and you ducked it or you went straight through it? Which one? Uh, I just waited and, and, and went around and then caught back up. Oh, wow. And uh, final question, performance round. It's been a great interval session. The hardest session you've ever done? What was it? A 40K long run. I did 40K long runs for the first time in the lead up to Rio. It was hard yards and I decided that given Rio went so badly that I wouldn't do them ever again. So now I just will always remain a tick under that 40K mark. Yeah, wow. So uh, that's, but who knows? It might be a harder session coming up in the next, you know, 12 or 18 <laughs> months, which brings me to the, the next few questions here, Lisa. What's on your bucket list, both inside sport and outside sport for you? Um, I think outside sport, uh, we, I would like to get back onto partner track with, um, with my corporate career. So, um, you know, with running, it's always hard to, with travel and things like that to, um, to move into that sort of executive level and, and um, because you need to be available a little bit more 24-7. So, um, so I certainly would like to do that um, at some stage when I, when I, uh, I wouldn't say retire from running because I'll never retire from running, but more so when I'm not fast enough to, uh, to make teams. Uh, and from a running perspective, I really just want to try and find out um, how fast I can go and, and you know, be in the elite field for a few more of the majors to see what that is and, and give myself the best opportunity to do that. Um, but I guess the main goal right now that's in the forefront of my mind um, now that I've hit that 225 mark is is Commonwealth Games and, and finishing better than I ever have before at Commonwealth Games because, um, you know, that's something that's dear to all Australians and all Australian athletes and, and I just love the opportunity to um, get back on the podium. Yeah, wow. Well, and when, as you say, uh, there can only be two spots in front of better than you have before. So that bronze medal in 2010, there's, there's silver <laughs> and there's gold. And given that we're going to be on the Gold Coast, I think, uh, you know, it's going to be such a significant event, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's going to be amazing fantastic you know it's going to be so good to be able to just duck up north and uh and compete and and not have all the other challenges that go with uh uh, long travel and and things like that for some of the championship races so i'm really excited and and with it being michael's hometown um even more exciting because he's sort of like a a brother to us so yeah uh, yeah, so it's um yeah it feels like it's our own home city really yeah well it is we'll have you we'll have you lisa absolutely gladly (laughs) you said something interesting there you never see yourself from retiring from running um can you unpack that a little yeah look you often see people that you know announce their retirement and i don't think as runners that you would really ever retire as such because as runners you start running because it's something you enjoy and you have a passion for that and, and you enjoy the buzz and the feeling of, of, of getting fit and being healthy. And so I would never, ever think about myself as, as retiring from the sport. I'd, I'll just continue on and, and one day I just won't be in a position where I can enter a race. And, and so, um, yeah, like I just keep going until, until that comes. Well, there was a 101-year-old that just won some medals at the uh, World <laughs> Masters Athletics in uh, in Auckland. So, uh, hey, I'll be cheering. I'll be cheering you on. <laughs> if I'm alive at 101, I'll be pretty happy. <laughs> I reckon you'll be fiercely competitive. Really fun question, uh, Lisa. And then we want to throw to some of these uh, more serious listener questions. Um, if you could invite three people to dinner living or past who would be at your table and why well i kind of have to cheat here and ask if i can have four but it would definitely be my grandparents because um i would just love to have my grandparents back i recently lost my last grandma um only a very short few weeks before i left for london and 
um, yeah, the close family that we all are, it'd be I'd give anything to have have my grandparents back for dinner again. So uh, that's what I would love. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, so there's a table with your beloved grandparents, both sets. Is that right? That's right. And they were big fans, obviously, of your career as you achieved all these things that you've achieved to date. Absolutely. They were all pretty um, pretty inspiring grandparents and I'm very lucky that I've had had them for as long as I have in and influenced my life. Yeah, beautiful. Were they any thoughts as you crossed at London? Yes, absolutely. And the, and they always are and you know, my grandparents have sacrificed a lot for for us kids and and um and you just want to sort of return that kind of um I guess example and an opportunity for for our kids and their kids as well. So, yeah, we're a pretty close-knit family, um, the Waitmans and MacArthur's. So, um, yeah, we uh, hopefully we can keep presenting that for, for our kids and, and theirs as the generations move on. Well, thanks for sharing that. And, uh, Lisa, we've got Amelia from Queensland, and Amelia's asked, what does a normal training week look like and what sort of nutrition takes part in the weeks before the marathon? Uh, so normal training is is probably about that 160k mark. Do a long run like most do. Um, we probably run a little bit quicker than than perhaps some runners do on a Sunday long run, and use that opportunity to really um, get those legs and and ready for the pounding on the road. Um, I'll tend to do like a pretty pretty standard structured week where we do our recovery runs Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, and we do longer sessions on Tuesday and Thursday. Might throw in a race or a tempo-type run on a Saturday, and, um, yeah, that's the week. I tend not to be able to do too many double runs um, just because of now that I've got a toddler and obviously I need to to uh, go to work and, and get babysitting help in order to do some of the runs. So, um, so now on a Friday I actually take the running pram out and, and that's been a bit of a strength session as well because I'm a pretty small person and the pram's pretty big and Pete's <laughs> a bit of a giant these days. So it's a little bit of a strength session on a Friday. <laughs> your pace, your K pace uh, definitely drops, right? I know it does for me running with my girls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. Jess asked, Jess Doldy asked, what pace does Lisa do her long runs and recovery runs at? Yeah, look, I don't uh, – Dick is a coach who doesn't actually really set paces for any of our runs. So – he will talk about some about our runs as like a star program. So we we might have a one star, a two star, and a three star um, on each of our runs, and that gives us an understanding of the intensity that we go at. Because it's a little hard when you're doing marathon training to to say to an athlete you must hit this time because you might it will really depend on what you've done in the lead up and you know how many how much mileage you've been doing and all the other aspects of of the training week. Uh, but I tend to try to run pretty solid. So, you know, I, I won't – it's not a talk – towards the second half of that, of the long run, it's not a talking run, but it's certainly not at race pace either. So if you think of something in between your ability to go for a run and have a chat on the Sunday run and then your flat-out race pace, yeah. if you pick something in the middle, that would be about the time to try and put – one else's perspective, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, for you, your racing pace for the marathon is probably the three twenty-five to thirty range. So you'd maybe sit on four-minute K pace for some of it. Would that be around about? Yeah, right? that's pretty good. And then we, yeah, and then for various sessions, we'll start to dip under that for various portions of the race, uh, depending on what that long run entails and whether it's hilly or whether it's a flat run, yeah. um, where it is, what the conditions are like, and what we've done the previous day. So if we've done some longer tempo type work the previous day, then that would change the Sunday run's pace um, just naturally because you've already worked pretty hard the day before. Uh, if you do something a bit shorter then and faster, then you might do a bit more in that long run. So it, it depends on the overall week. Um, but I guess the key is it's not recovery run pace on a Sunday. Um, recovery run pace can be anything from sort of 4.10 to 4.40 um, for me, because once again, it's the same thing. It really depends on what I've done the previous day or even two days. I usually find two days prior usually impacts that, that next day. And, um, yeah, we just tend to go by feel. Yeah. And uh, and just, you know, recovery runs are just that. It really doesn't matter how fast you run a recovery run as long as you get out and, 
and do something on that particular day and usually we're just trying to fill some miles for the week on those days. Yeah, a lot to be said by running to feel, isn't there? Mindo Window, how does Lisa manage the mum guilt? It's hard as a mum to put yourself first and feel as though you aren't, you aren't impacting family time. I struggled when training for my first and only half marathon because long runs took up a chunk of time. I would normally be home with the kids. Any tips? Um, it is hard. Uh, I won't lie about that. Uh, it, it's challenging, I guess. The tip for me is that my little boy probably loves my mum so, so much <laughs> and his other grandma Locke's mum uh, in Creswick so, so much that um, it makes it a lot easier for me. <laughs> he has an absolute ball with um, uh... with both of them, so you tend to feel pretty comfortable when you, um, when you leave with them giggling their heads off, all of them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and, and look, they both teach Pete so many new and cool things and and it's a really fun for him. So it's a lot easier for me in that sense. Um, the other part too is I guess Locke and I both love running, so it's not like it's an impact on our relationship either. It's not like he thinks I'm a nutcase because I go and run for two hours on a Sunday and wants me to stop. So, um, yeah, so I guess I guess um, those two things are fortunate that I met a runner and, and, um, and that we understand each other and that I've got a great family that look after Pete and want to, want to take care of him for me so that helps but you always feel like you want to be there and you want to not miss anything and I think that's the same for any parent who needs to put their child in childcare as well yeah. unfortunately I don't have to do that because mum looks up to Pete on the couple of days that I work and and uh, and um and I can work from home the third day so um but I'm sure that it would be gut-wrenching for me if I then had to um put him in childcare as well as as do my training and and miss out on quite a lot so I appreciate how hard it is for for mums to try and juggle all of that yeah and thanks for sharing so you know earnestly and you must be looking at the questions I'm looking at because Benny the runner did ask in seriousness how does Lisa manage to train with the time involved and not uh end up with a divorce so um so you've shared around that um lisa uh two fangirls and i know both these girls they're tremendous uh runners and um dedicated athletes christy mckay and sophie walker and and they've asked can they meet you when you come up to the sunny coast later in the year Perfect, perfect. I'm really looking forward to running the Sunshine Coast half. I had the best fun in Noosa when I trained up there last year, so I'm looking forward to getting up to the Sunshine Coast this year. And um, and so I'd love to catch up with the girls if they have time. All right, all right, girls. There's the open invitation. Lisa, what strategies, Tash Carly asks, what strategies, tricks do you use for the internal battle, the dialogue of pushing through the pain in those last few kilometres? Lisa, uh, Tash is looking to run her first marathon at the Gold Coast this year. Well, the first thing to really think about is the fact that the faster you go towards the end, the quicker it's all over. <laughs> so that was one strategy and one thought that was going on in my head towards the end of the, the marathon recently. Um, the other thing too, I guess, is that if you if I, I'm an athlete that I like to prepare for things and just, just in general with life, so if I'm prepared for a race, and everything's on track, then I tend to be quite calm and I tend to just treat the marathon like I treat any other race, and that is to focus on my competitors and to focus on catching people in front of me and, and the, the normal things I would do in a 10K race. Um, so I guess to, to be constantly focusing on the environment and, and looking at what other people are doing and, and taking all that in is um, it helps me to stop thinking about myself and just to sort of divert my attention other in other areas. Uh, but, you know, there'll be a patch. There'll absolutely be a patch. There might be four or five patches. Just don't know. It's different for every marathon. But there'll be a patch where you feel like, whoa, this is a really long way. Um, and you really, you know, get a little bit of doubt there. And, and you just got to ride through that. And, and I, I can't stress enough that you will get through it. Um, just know that. And when those demons come in, you just say, no, nah, I'll get through this. I might slow down a little bit, but I'll get through it. And that helps you. Um, and and then the next time you'll you'll know that feeling, and you'll remember that um, for the next one, next one, and the next one after that potentially. Sound advice. Was there a mantra you had going through your head when you hit those patches in London recently? Not really. I don't really have those sort of things. Um, Oh, lots of different thoughts go in my head. It would be really interesting, actually, to be able to record people's thoughts when you run 
is well, it would be probably a bit embarrassing as well, I think. <laughs> well, well, it's funny you say that. Our previous guest of the program, uh, Chris McCormack, <laughs> Ironman champion Macca, he, his sports psychologist once uh, rode a bike alongside him, Lisa, while he did a very intense interval session and she asked him to yell out his thoughts and uh, they, they journaled them down. He was quite embarrassed when he looked at them. He realised he was quite negative. So yeah. uh, it, would be, it would, be, would be quite confronting, I imagine. Lisa, if you could boil down... All the learnings you've had from your very successful career to date, all the highs and the lows that obviously go with that, what would be the one bit of advice that you'd give Lisa Waitman to physical performers out there who are trying to achieve their best, whatever the endeavour? The one bit of advice. I think one key piece of advice would be that you never really know what you're capable of until you test yourself out. There's been so many limits put on me and I've broken them every time and, and, and every time I've thought, wow, I actually just achieved that. So um, don't put any limits on yourself. Just just enjoy the journey and, um, and keep testing yourself because um, if you don't take any risks, then you really don't know what you're capable of. Yeah, beautiful. And Lisa, what is your physical challenge of the week going to be for listeners? This can be entry level. It can be very difficult. It can be anywhere in between. But it's one thing that Lisa Waitman is going to issue as a challenge for the listeners of the program for the week uh, of the show going live. What's it going to be, Lisa? Um, I think it for those who uh, would be wanting to sort of understand what sort of pace is required to run 225, I reckon um, go out and do um, six by a K at, at sort of 326 pace and then see whether that's something that you could continue doing for for a long period of time. Well, if you take on that uh, that challenge, and it is a challenge, listeners, Lisa's talking about a decent speed there, uh, very decent speed, then uh, please uh, jump on and uh, let us know on social. Where can listeners follow your journey, Lisa, onwards to uh, the Com Games on the Gold Coast in 2018 and beyond? Where can we find you online? Um, so I'm on Instagram. Uh, I'm not a, a huge Instagram um a writer but i'll tend to try and put a few snippets out there but i certainly would love to to speak and hear to all of the listeners and 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 i'm more than happy to um answer any questions along the way if people have any any questions there's instagram i'm on facebook as well um and yeah just just get in touch through those means really otherwise yeah just happy running and and um yeah enjoy it because um we have an amazing sport that allows us to feel healthy fit we get to join groups meet new people um and just yeah help each other achieve so really anything with it we want to do in the sporting world we should make sure we enjoy it and don't um don't see it as a chore and on that note lisa waitman you have crossed another finish line <laughs> well <laughs> congratulations and lisa just publicly i want to acknowledge you for um several things one the time we're recording this on a saturday evening we both had a little bit of a chuckle it's quite unconventional um we push, <laughs> we push play around about 8 p.m on a saturday evening um don't think that we're Cool, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you publicly for your generous uh, time around your busy schedule. Secondly, uh, I just want to acknowledge that you're such a role model, Lisa, right? and I know that um, you go about your business in a very quiet and humble manner. Um, and, you know, by no means you're flashy. You are, as you say, a hard worker. And uh, I think that is what those that know you and follow your success really admire about you, the way you go about it. You let your results speak for themselves. So I just find that so refreshing and, um, and so commendable. So Lisa Waitman, on behalf of the listeners and myself, we wish you all the best for the, uh, for the coming years and particularly the Gold Coast um, Commonwealth Games. Thanks so much, Brad. Brad look forward to uh, being there and catching up in person. I'll be cheering from the sideline. <laughs> Thank you. So there you have it, listeners, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you enjoyed it. And if you took something away from it, I hope you did, maybe more than one thing I suspect, please let Lisa and myself know. Your feedback means an enormous amount. And you can do that via jumping over to social and dropping some feedback to Lisa and myself and letting us know what it is that you took away or enjoyed or you were inspired by. If you'd like to get this podcast, The Physical Performance Show, in your earbuds each week, then subscribing is a good way to do that. Simply 
click subscribe from within your app and you will see the show populated there each and every week. Now also, if you are enjoying the program, I'd love it if you'd share it with someone that you think would also enjoy it. You can do that simply through copying the URL and forwarding that onto them. Sharing is definitely caring and it's a real hoot to see people link this show to friends that they've run with or been out training with and that feeds back through different mediums to me and I think it's a beautiful example of how things can uh, be so easily shared in today's digital age. If you'd like to get a copy of the show notes, be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au. You'll also find Lisa's social media handles there and any other contact details if you want to get in touch with Lisa. Big thank you, as always, to the two good folk who bring this podcast to you, the listener, each and every week, Mr. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, and Susan Wilkin, the show's VA. Big thanks, guys. Thanks for the excellent work that you do. If you're into running, two messages for you today. One, don't miss out on this year's Gold Coast Airport Marathon. It's coming up in just a matter of weeks the first weekend of July 2017, the first and second. You can compete in any distance race from the marathon, the full marathon, through to the half marathon brought to you by ASICS, through to the Southern Cross Uni 10K run, the Star Gold Coast 5.7K challenge, or the Zespri 4K Junior Dash. So there's an event for everyone. It's one of my favorite events on the calendar, my hometown race. It's beautiful weather. It's typically very crystal clear, beautiful day, and the crowd and atmosphere make this race really, really special. So don't miss it if you're looking for a running challenge this year. And lastly, if you're into your running, then be sure to check out my Amazon running and jogging bestseller, You Can Run Pain-Free. It's 330 plus pages packed full of my five-step method that I've used for the better part of 11 years as a physiotherapist to help runners do what the title says, enjoy injury-free and faster running. You can pick it up now on Audible or iBooks and run with it in your ears, or you can pick it up at traditional uh, online retailers such as Amazon, or you can pick it up through traditional mediums such as your Kindle or Amazon, or through paperback copy via pogophysio.com.au on Australian shores or Amazon internationally. Coming up on next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, I catch up with Australian Olympic triathlete Aaron Royal. I caught up with Aaron after he'd recently relocated over to Yorkshire and has begun training with Alistair and Jonathan Brownlee and his partner, Non Stanford. Aaron shares some training gold. He shares around making his Olympic debut what was going through his head on the start line. He shares around his aspirations for the future and a whole lot more. So if you're into triathlon, you're going to love it. If you're into performance, you're going to love Aaron Royal. Be sure to tune in next week. And until then, keep pursuing your physical best. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Hold up. 